I would like to start the session with um, with something that I read, which I found interesting um, from the Magnum Photos website about Zorab. Um, and then it would be over to you. <laughs> Zorab Ghura was born on 17th October 1981 in a small town called Chinsura in West Bengal, India. And he grew up changing his ambitions from one exciting thing to another. He started with dreams of growing up and becoming a dog, which later turned to becoming a superhero, and then to a veterinarian, to a herpetologist, to becoming a wildlife filmmaker. Today, he's a photographer after having completed his master's in economics. And it goes on. One, the quote that's written above it is something I would also like you to speak a little bit about because, quite frankly, it, it befuddled me. Um, so I'll just read that out as well. For the person that I am, I cannot afford to try and have authorship over any language over time because I don't think I'm capable of surviving that repetition and the strong feeling within me of one's photography being destroyed by one being a photographer has provided me a lifeline. I have to try and just survive for as long as I can. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was going through stuff, I'm sure, at that time that I said something like this. But basically, um, you know, um, when I started photography, I think um, everyone talked to me about authorship, you know. So, I mean, I studied economics, so I went and I um, photographed... Um, I went along with one of my economics professors and I worked in around Narega, you know, um, because I felt like photography could be a tool to maybe um, bring a change of some sort. Um, on the other hand, I was also using photography for my own self, more as catharsis. So right from the beginning, I kind of felt that... Um, there was a sort of a bifurcation in my relationship with photography. And at, at the same time, from the time I started, you know, when you are kind of um, trying to seek advice from people and you're also getting advice from people who you're not really necessarily seeking advice from, but they still want to tell you stuff. Uh, so everyone started talking to me about um, what's your authorship because you're doing this and you're doing that. And you can't do both, so choose one. You know, so I was always, uh, in a way, um, asked to choose one, and I never really was able to. Um, so that kind of really confused me at the time because, uh, anyway, this whole idea of authorship got very rooted to the idea of style, and 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 somehow, um, mm, for me, that didn't make sense, and I wasn't really able to articulate it at that time. But um, I think in the beginning, I tried to convince myself that one was, you know, the whole catharsis bit was more for me, and this I was just doing on the side, even though I felt really passionately about it, and yeah, I believed in what I was doing. But somehow, at that time, um, there was this um, these other voices that were kind of um, like I'm always. Especially now, I'm very conscious of thinking of when I'm when I'm trying to talk about my method or even photography in general. I end up thinking in terms of architecture. So, you know, because I'm always talking about the idea of building, and at that time, um, I think the pathway that I was trying to build, the architecture of it, seemed to be defined a lot by these external voices. You know, and there was a lot of um, confusion and doubt with which I was kind of um, going about things. Um, not just the other people who are confused by me, but I was also kind of confused because I was kind of paying a lot of attention to that. But somehow I was quite lucky that I kind of carried on and I, I made um, certain decisions and choices which seemed to be quite selfish, you know, uh, and I had to kind of hold on to it. And over a period of time, I realized that I was, it wasn't just about these two works. Those two works had branched out into many different sort of um, forms. And... Um, this was still at a time, and I think this is the baggage of photography in general, um, because I think somehow, um, maybe with literature, and I'm sure it happens with that as well, but I would like to imagine that with literature, people are able to maybe pay more attention to the undercurrents, and 
uh, you might recognize a writer's voice not necessarily by the style of the writing, but also certain nuances that the person might bring in. But somehow, with the I guess the historical baggage of photography, it was quite. Um, I think we always looked at black and white classic, you know, magnumist sort of style or more sort of contemporary color. You know, like we always categorizing photography in a certain way, and um, maybe people need to categorize it. But somehow, I felt it was being imposed onto me, and I wasn't that sort of a person. I think today, in retrospect, I can talk about my relationship to photography being more like a conversation. You know, like I'm <clears throat> right now talking to whoever is over here, and I, I don't know who's here, but I'm always I can see your little thumbnail uh, at the corner of my screen. But in general, I feel very awkward. This whole thing of having these Zoom conversations or the Zoho conversations, we're talking to our computers, and <clears throat> at times we don't know whether someone is listening to us. So. While we are talking, you know, those thoughts come in. It changes the way I might um, enunciate what I'm saying. It might change the tone of my voice. Um, maybe right now I'm talking about my own process, but if I talk about something else, for example, what's happening with all the migrant crisis because of a stupid government, you know, uh, I might my tone might change. So I realized that um, my very being, with the way I'm kind of expressing myself. Uh, is not static. It keeps changing depending on different um, sort of permutation combinations of different factors. And today, when I look back at my process, even photography, I feel like um, I was never really choosing that I want to photograph like this or photograph like that. What was actually happening was that I was, of course, taking in my um, experience and also my sort of exposure to the history of photography. But what was coming out was something more organic. You know, somehow um, I was recognizing certain expectations that came with photography over time. Um, maybe my early work, Life is Elsewhere, which was more like autobiographical. Obviously, it was very influenced. But at the same time, I think somewhere inside me, like I didn't consciously decide that I'll have to photograph like this. But somehow to kind of really dumb it down uh, for like, because we are like, I'm... Uh, just to make it really simple, it's um, like black and white, blurry, you know, could mean existential uh, photography, you know, or like um, sort of color, distant, muted colors, you know, where the depth of field is uh, quite shallow. It might sort of provoke a certain atmosphere of feeling um, in photography. So somehow I kind of started to recognize I mean, sorry for oversimplifying things, but uh, just to kind of get the point across that um, I was starting to recognize that uh, there was also these historical sort of layers that were being added in terms of what um, role photography might you know, perform. Uh, and I was realizing that I had kind of you know, absorbed a lot of it and I was quite organically putting it all out. So if I was... At that time, when I was in my early 20s, when I was going through something, you know, when I wanted to escape, I couldn't help but make images in a certain way because they were just kind of pouring out of me. And then um, for me to kind of go back to a village and to kind of do that, it didn't make sense, you know, uh, because I feel like many photographers pick up a style or not just photographers, I think it happens with many practitioners. You kind of identify a sort of a working method, a working identity, what you might assume it is, and you kind of start to apply it everywhere. You know, and going back to the whole thing of me having a conversation with you all like this and me being so conscious, if I was with some friends, I might be having a very different kind of a tone in my voice. You know, and so photography for me became that way of finding uh, the different tone, the different pacing, the different way I'm stressing upon certain words um, or certain images in this case. Um, photography for me became more of a fluid way of expressing myself than taking one style and applying it everywhere. So I felt that um, if I was to kind of apply something that seemed to have worked for me, because there was also this external voices which were trying to encourage me to do the same thing over and over again, um, which kind of, um, you know, um, 
were expecting me to repeat what I'd done in my first work in that sense. Um, it didn't make sense to me because I felt that I had to kind of uh, relate to each situation on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I anyway believe today that photography, in a, in a sense, is a performative experience. I mean, if I could say that, simply because it's about me inserting myself in different situations uh, and kind of finding my way about that situation. And then the photographs are just a residue. So how can I actually have a preconceived notion of like a style and then apply it somewhere? So when I must have written this, you know, for the Magnum bio where you found it, I was also aware that Magnum is also a platform. And once, for me, it was also a very thought out um, a very considered decision to apply to Magnum and I was aware of a baggage that comes along with it you know uh, things have changed quite a bit now but um, I mean there's always scope for changing more as well but at that time I think um, it was a little different I felt and um, I, f I didn't want to sort of pigeonhole myself into also being a Magnum photographer whatever that is you know and, and to kind of um, then have to struggle later to kind of try and explain all my work. So I wanted to take on a sort of declare something beforehand, even at the time of my joining, that this is not who I am, you know, and what is important to me is actually whether I'm able to survive or not. And that is something which um, is more and more uh, sort of urgent to me because I'm realizing that um, a lot of my, um, you know, um, like every day when I wake up, it's it's almost like, do I have that enthusiasm? Do I have that excitement to sort of make more work? And forget about even making work. It's also just about, do I have the excitement to really uh, be excited about meeting the world outside or even, you know, around me? How am I actually relating to the world? Um, am I kind of getting cynical uh, in a way which is stopping me from engaging more? Or, you know, um, am I still willing to kind of... Um, uh, am I still being really curious? The whole thing of curiosity and wanting to experiment and, you know, wanting to be open to making mistakes. Um, all of those things are important to me. I think that the moment I end up um, uh, being scared of making mistakes and allowing for accidents and chance and assuming that, you know, I found something, I also feel like that is when I consider myself dead as someone who needs to express, you know, because then I'm just... Uh, being mechanical. So that element of repetition that I brought in was more to do with this um, fear of, you know, turning into a machine and just regurgitating what I know, you know, and then I don't really care. I just know exactly how to do it. And I think right when I finished Life is Elsewhere towards the end, I also kind of realized that I knew exactly what image to make, you know, uh, and that was what was scary for me. So I think what I said kind of came from all of those sort of different places. Okay. Um, so some of your photographs capture what is naturally unfolding and others seem to be like a lot more orchestrated. So mm -hmm. how do you decide like when, when, when you take what kind of photograph, especially when, when the, when the event or whatever is unfolding, it just happens. It's just momentary. And if you capture it, you capture it. Otherwise, it, it kind of goes. And what do you think is the relevance of both types of photographs? I mean, uh, see, I'm not, I'm not a photojournalist who needs to, who, for whom, you know, there is this sort of uh, an ethical line to kind of, like, I don't believe that photography is the true represent, I mean, it is the representation of, uh, a universal truth, you know. Um, in a way, I feel when you look at even a play or theater where there's a lot of orchestration, very often they're able to kind of reveal different layers of truth in different ways, you know, as opposed to um, writing a report on a certain situation. So for me personally, I am... Um, I mean, my working method is more in terms of being a writer or a filmmaker because I think the whole idea is to sort of create um, an experience or a world. 
and not necessarily to uh, give facts or information. So I'm not really, for me, it's no problem in that sense. Like I'm not claiming that these are factual images, you know, and this is exactly what happened because even if I'm sort of working in that, um, in that way, I'm aware that in the end, what I'm showing you and also what I'm looking at through the viewfinder is, is just a limited sort of a cut out of the larger, you know, visual sort of experience that I'm happening. And I can also manipulate and in a way, uh, manipulate facts by just turning certain situations, you know, my, my perspective. So in the end, I think it's about perspective. Um, and I think that, um, I don't believe that there's objectivity because every perspective kind of comes from a very specific place. And, and, um, I don't also think I'm a good director, so I don't really feel comfortable in really directing situations to make an image. Uh, because what is important to me is not really making the images, but to, uh, like I was mentioning, to be in certain situations because that, like taking photographs is just an excuse to kind of um, maybe, maybe have encounters or or, uh, you know, uh, be in certain situations that I might not have been if I was not a photographer. Um, and, and when I'm there, I'm kind of um, with a camera because I'm usually, uh, I can be a bit shy in sort of um, approaching certain situations, but the camera kind of gives me that, uh, you know, um, the courage in a way uh, to kind of, uh, even if it is, two people talking somewhere just to even go and ask them, can I actually make an, make a portrait? You know, uh, I would hesitate quite a bit. And, and I think maybe, maybe this, a lot of photographers might, it might resonate with them that, um, sometimes many of us, if you are going by something, especially if you are in a moving, if you're going in a bus or, you know, going on a motorbike or a car or cycle, or even walking for some time, uh, at some moments where, um, we see something which you feel like we really want to kind of photograph it, but somehow we always, a part of us says that maybe later, you know, there's always an excuse to not stop and do it. I think it comes a lot from that hesitation. I think all of us are a, a little shy to some extent in, in like, we, we don't want to include too much. So photography, I think helps me to um, break that barrier. And, um, and, and, you know, even if I'm making a portrait that is also staged, right? I'm asking the person if, um, if I'm kind of, um, doing it, uh, if I can make a photograph, um, but in the end, I think things are more complex. It's not really like, I think my being in a certain situation is affecting the situation, you know? So even if I'm not literally asking the person, can I, you know, photograph you all? Can I photograph the situation? Uh, just my presence itself kind of changes things. And sometimes people might perform more because of, you know, my situation. Sometimes people might retract more because of my situation, uh, my being over there. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, the, the kind of, um, the spaces where I'm working, um, the, these dynamics can be quite gray. So I can't really say that, you know, I, I, um, direct people or I don't, because I think for me, it's, it's quite fluid and it's quite, um, it's quite, um, uh, there's some more, some spaces where I don't know what is really happening. Am I really asking the person or, you know, is there sort of a negotiation of some sorts that is happening? And in the end, um, also, I'm trying to build something larger than one photograph, you know? So when I'm, when I'm talking about my final relationship to the work, it's more in terms of the large sort of, you know, the structure that I'm building. And maybe there's some parts where I very consciously asked people to kind of uh, be in a certain position, sit in a particular way. Can you like touch someone's face in a certain way, as opposed to some other situations where you know, um, where, um, I'm allowing for things to unfold and, and I'm allowing for, uh, you know, my own, 
my own self to kind of experience something and um it's a mix of all these things that kind of um, you know defines it's a bit of my my in general my work method is like a mix of intuition and uh, something very conscious so even if i'm editing if i'm making photographs most it's mostly intuitive and if if when i'm editing it's it's kind of a mix of both you know there's more of a balance um but maybe the conscious images that i end up making are um you know imagine if you have a straight line and um if you have like one little bump in that straight line somehow um some other one bump really becomes profound as opposed to one straight line many little you know waves um then you know that it's waves and straight line you know um so the idea is also to kind of maybe create an experience where um i mean like someone had asked me once because apparently i've written somewhere about broken photography and i think it's not just broken photography but in general um i mean everything that i'm trying to create or even experience um i think there are always some glitches you know so like right now when early on when i'm you're doing the test you saw the green bar and i don't know if it's only you seeing it but another people are seeing the gr- green bar by the side of my screen um somehow it it kind of fits in because um if it was too perfect an experience or too perfect a photograph or too perfect a body of work i'm extremely skeptical of it you know so um this whole thing of maybe trying to photograph as organically as i can and then suddenly there there's like one or two departures which are more um um sort of conscious or posed or constructed or however you want to define it uh those for me become those uh, little um you know uh scars uh in the in the larger thing that i'm making and and i think it's it's just trying to never really um let some something be too sort of definite or stationary you know there needs to be something that sort of becomes a sort of an entry point for someone you know something pops up something kind of i'm looking at something something needs to kind of take my mind somewhere else as well so i don't know if i'm being able to articulate it but this whole thing of uh, trying to create an experience which kind of might seem to be holistic but yet there is some sort of hole in it you know um so which is why uh it's about this balance of things which i'm trying to sort of bring in um in most especially more and more of late so this experience that you're talking about and also you spoke about how it's not like the individual photograph but also just like a larger collective um do you do you know what the experience is that you want to create in others and then and then sort of try to make that happen through your photographs or is it also process where you go looking for some something that you have in your head or do you just find it no i think um um also can you just uh, can you also put this in perspective with some of the photographs that you've taken and what your process has been in those yeah sure i mean um you know like i think um i never really work in terms of deciding what topic should i work on and then go looking for it um my belief is that uh there is something kind of around us all the time uh, which from where we can pick up on a thread you know um and um and i think um to give an example to my own work um like i was always aware like i have this work called snow uh, for example you know uh, it's work from kashmir now i've always known about i've always had this very incomplete in- information on kashmir right we always hear that it's like a conflict area there is you know we used to like i grew up listening about terrorism terrorist attacks kashmiri pandit exodus and so on and so forth and somehow um 
there was a sort of a, um, an image that I built while growing up. And, you know, you had like um, these foreign tourists who disappeared in, I think, 1996, four of them, and one of them was found beheaded. So, and then there was the Kargil War, and which took place in that region. And, and um, somehow, you know, all these things, events that were unfolding, including Babri Masjid demolition, the Bombay bomb blasts, you know, this whole thing of religion also came in, Muslim, you know, and Kashmir being like a um, uh, predominantly uh, Muslim, uh, like the de demography is predominantly Muslim, you know. So I felt that somehow a lot of these narratives that were shaping me when I was growing up, they seemed to be influencing my perspective about Kashmir. And um, and uh, basically, um, um, what was happening was that um, like I knew about Kashmir. I kind of also heard about Kunan Pushpura. You know, I heard about the SOGs. I heard about all the other atrocities that were happening. But someone, nothing made me go there and photograph. You know, because that just wasn't me. Uh, to kind of go there. I went to the villages in India because my, uh, to, uh, 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 you know, central India and all because um, uh, my professor Jardres had asked me to come along with him. You know, so there was some sort of a um, personal connect and inroad into all these spaces where I'd gone to. Um, it was only when I went to Kashmir for the first time on holiday that I kind of experienced how uh, generous the place is and, and, and how incredible the people are, how warm the people are, and and it's quite overwhelming, you know, uh, to to go there as an outsider, especially as an Indian, because we go with our own preconceived notions, and and then you you experience something which is so incredibly touching, uh, uh, the land, the people, all of it coming together, you know, and then you kind of realize how, like I realize how uh, weird it was that. I was thinking I was in Kashmir, but I was basically just in Gulmarg, and and which is a tourist resort. And everyone around me was an Indian tourist. And on the side there was the army, and there were hardly any Kashmiris. And all the Kashmiris were there working in the hotels and so on. And then when I made my way back to the airport, so the system also usually ends up being like people go straight from the airport to Gulmarg. And then when I was on my way back, I kind of started to notice all the. I mean, I did obviously see all the armored cars and armored trucks and all the, you know, CRPF soldiers and so on lined up across. But somehow, but after experiencing all of that, when I went back on my way back, I kind of noticed it more than before and just ended up feeling really weird, you know? And, and then when I came back home, when I was having conversations with friends or other people, they would also tell me, yeah, yeah, yeah I went to Kashmir. You know, like two years ago, it was amazing. And then when, when I tried to find out where all did he go, it would become Gulmarg or Pahalgam, you know. And I kind of felt that it was very odd that that became a sort of idea of what Kashmir was. It was reduced to something like Gulmarg uh, or Pahalgam, you know. Um, and having experienced something there, one little sort of uh, moment, that's what made me want to go back. But it was, it was me trying to figure out what else Kashmir was, you know, but it wasn't me going there to illustrate a topic of a, a zone of conflict, you know, or the most militarized zone, because, because in the end, what is important to me is also um, that whatever work I'm doing, I'm able to take responsibility for it. Like, um, I don't, like, I don't just... Um, blankly believe in this notion of ethics because very often the way ethics kind of gets used um, it, it becomes a sort of a set of codes that is put together by someone who is not me and I'm expected to kind of you know follow those codes but in most occasions reality is far more complex than you know very sort of edified um, sort of simple codes uh, of what one must do you know, um, I've like when I was in Kashmir, the you know when I started going there, I realized that um, 
a lot of my kashmiri friends whose works i saw they, it came from a very uh, it came from personal histories even though they were sort of you would see images of stone pelting downtown shrinagar you know all the women in hazrat bal and all like raising the arms um those sort of stereotypes they're very real but it comes from a very specific perspective and that which wasn't mine and what became really important for me on going there was you know um people were so amazing with me and and like i've never felt safer in any other place in this region i won't call it india um and uh, um i realized that you know people would always say um I'm Kashmiri, you're Indian. So everything was beautiful there, but somehow people will always separate these identities. Now I'm someone who does not really care about nationality and special nationalism and all of those things. But I ended up feeling like the only thing I could do here was to actually to kind of embrace my identity, belonging to this sort of a. abstract notion of a nation and and in a way also look at my own denial so and of course like by looking at my own denial as an indian i'm also in a way trying to project it onto a larger sort of context but i also realized that no matter how much i had kind of um assumed that kind of knew about kashmir before going there the more you go there the more you realize that uh you hardly know anything and there's a constant sort of cycle of learning and unlearning and and i think for me that's not a bad thing it's just that uh in fact i feel like it can be an infinite process infinite cycle of learning and unlearning because everything changes and in any case like in any space whether it's kashmir whether it's here whether it's tamil nadu whether i think everyone has very different perspectives and the idea is to kind of constantly be uh, finding a way out you know and and people there kind of become my you know store like when people are telling me things these oral histories from that place become sort of pathways for me so um for me now to to talk about my own process for me to kind of have started from a place where i had assumed that i kind of um new about kashmir and then to go and illustrate that um i don't think i would have been able to take responsibility for it because i mean kashmir is way beyond my scope of understanding in many many levels and all i can actually be really clear about it is what my relationship to it is and i know who i am as a person and at the same time what context do i belong to you know so when i'm going there i'm always an outsider and never really assuming that you know it's it's its own space and and uh, so yeah so i hope in some ways i was able to kind of answer your question um simply because i end up being quite abstract and you know um would you like to would you like to me to also answer some of the questions in between or should we should we go ahead no, with... yeah i'm getting them from multiple sources so i'm just going to be going back and forth with them so i mean what does it need to become a professional photographer i'm really the worst person to ask this because um i mean technically speaking you need a job um and then you become a professional but personally i don't really care whether you are professional non professional um because i think my i mean i never started photography uh to become a professional or to kind of start a career in it i think um at a time when i found photography i was not in a good place and photography made me feel uh good after a long time and uh, this became a way for me to kind of feel like i exist uh because at that point i fe- felt like i was quite worthless and you know all of those things were happening and photography made me feel really good after a after a long long time so so um, my relationship to photography from the beginning itself was non sort of career oriented but today like i would say that um um I, like i don't know what you need to become a professional photographer but i would just say that you need to ask yourself why you want to become a professional photographer because um 
it's also not that easy you know uh, to kind of live as a photographer because it just seems really glamorous from outside and and uh, maybe out of like 100 200 300 it seems like one person is doing something which looks really cool and glamorous but it may not even be that cool or glamorous in reality um but people are struggling to get jobs and 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 it's not easy and if you feel like if if you're someone who loves photography if you can do something else to support yourself and yet do photography to nourish you that for me would be an amazing con- you know combination um i have somehow got lucky to kind of be able to survive and to still have this relationship with photography but i also see many people who love photography and they start to not really care about it it's at some point of time because i think the the concerns become more about when when will i get my next assignment you know and and it's it's a pretty competitive space and i think this is something you might get clearer sort of answers from uh maybe you know some of the other attendees here like i can see satish i can see you know sentel you should definitely catch hold of sentel he's extremely helpful you know and there are two pradeshnis here i think you can catch hold of them you know so i think the people who are around you who might have a much better sort of um grasp of this and also maybe they may be at a different sort of a place i think i've i'm someone also um who's come from privilege in a way where i didn't have to uh, worry about many things that other people might have had to you know um and and i feel it'll be unfair for me to kind of say something definite to you all and at the same time coming from that privilege i've gone to even more privilege like something like magnum you know uh, in that sense a platform where um, i have someone else to kind of do the dirty work of looking for assignments and i can sit here and happily talk to you all about you know how you can inspire yourself and all so it's also a reality check that i think is important uh to kind of give out that um it's important that you consider why you want to be a photographer and uh, why why you want to be a professional photographer um because if it's something you love um you know you need to if you can do something else i would say don't give that up because a lot of photographers after becoming professional start to think about finding a job elsewhere you know so um yeah and um uh, there's a question now uh, about uh, about yeah so the question is do you ever find the need to explain your photographs like or do you prefer if they speak for themselves and if they're kind of open to interpretation so what do you think is the relevance of having a description for a photograph or for a series uh it's uh, i mean i don't know if i have a clear answer for it i think to say just to say that um um photogra- a photograph speaks a thousand words and all of that stuff and you don't need a w- words to go along with it i find that to be quite a machoistic way of looking at photography because um i think that sometimes context does make a difference um and at the same time it's not really about explaining a photograph it's about i think more i would think in terms of if you feel like you can put a photograph in a specific context then why not you know and at the same time sometimes a photograph can accompany a text where both of them are independent um because very often what ends up happening is that we also turn photographs into illustrations or something larger that for me is a problem and that's where i feel like that's when one can come in and say the photograph should also speak so so it all depends on the context in which it's used and i actually write a lot but very often it's about my process um not to really explain my work or to um it's not really to explain my work or explain photographs or anything like that it's more i think um, what i felt what i feel right now is that um i might have known something inside intuitively but the moment i'm able to articulate it the moment i'm able to kind of uh, articulate specific words to sort of uh express something as precisely as possible it makes me look at everything very differently you know the moment i kind of put it out there 
and that is the reason why i like to write about my process it's not necessarily to um explain to people it's more it comes from a place where it's more about my kind of being as uh, conscious of the architecture that's being built you know um and and um and then also of course if i'm writing something it needs to also be open to other people and and of course i would want people to get as close to where the place that is important to me but in the end i know that you know uh, someone can actually take another meaning out of it but the whole what is exciting for me is not whether mm-hmm. someone will um understand it not understand it what is exciting is to kind of uh create these traps or baits you know you can it's like fishing in a way sometimes or to create this infrastructure you know you create a maze for someone to kind of walk in a particular way you obviously want to influence people in the way you know they might enter your sort of world um but in the end you have to be okay with you know with the fact that maybe it does not really work out but what is exciting is this whole um sort of process of constructing that sort of uh space for people to move about you know so even if i'm thinking in terms of text uh going with my photographs or i mean i won't even use the word explanation but it's more to add to this navigation that i'm trying to influence um because i know that there can be many meanings you know um so there's someone who talked about emptiness uh where uh, yeah i mean sure uh i mean i can't really answer whether um someone should get inspiration or not can everyone read these questions or do i have to read these questions out no, no they, they won't be they won't be reading all the questions It's... oh okay okay so someone has asked as a photographer there are many days that i feel empty like i don't have an opinion on anything i see or the need to photograph anything i forget that i'm a photographer but i see people reacting to a lot of things on the internet which kind of bugs me a little that i'm doing nothing should i get go get inspiration or should i go with the flow firstly i mean i wish you can tell me where i can go and get inspiration because it sounds like there's a market out there that you know of which is really having a great deal right now and i would love to also go get inspiration i mean i don't know i think um um this is uh, i think it's a very real sort of question because in the beginning i was mentioning you know responding to um your first question that you had asked for example about what i had written and i was saying that every day i'm trying to wake up and figure out whether that excitement to really uh not even it's not just about photography but it's about actually the world you know am i excited to get up and look at my room am i excited to get up and maybe cook myself something you know uh, and i mean i mean for me photography comes from that place i think very often um if i'm if i'm talking to any of you who's listening in um you know you'll be able to kind of and if i want to know who you are you might be able to uh talk about you know what inspires you as a person what you hate what you love you know what drives you crazy um which which person next to you you don't like you know you can give me some gossip as well uh you can make a comment on you know the world of politics today about what is happening today with the situation you know um with migrants you will give, give me you know uh very specific uh, opinions on uh, maybe maybe politics within tamil nadu you know maybe the dravidian politics i mean the thing is that as people we have a lot of opinions and and um, i think we are living you know we are kind of engaging we are making sense of the world and then you know suddenly i ask you oh so you're a photographer and you say yes and i'm like so what are you working on and then you put on your photographer hat and then you're like uh actually i don't know what project i'm working on i don't know what i should do now what work should i do now so very often i think we as people or we as photographers uh, separate ourselves from who we are as people and 
who we are as photographers. So we might have a lot to kind of say when we think of ourselves as people and then suddenly we take on this conscious role of being photographers and then we assume that there is a sort of a, a preconceived method or a formula that we need to apply to something. And I see it happen with a lot of photographers, you know, and, 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 um, and I think that this sometimes as a person, you might go through days that are really blah and you wake up and you really don't want to do anything. Like I had many of those days, like in between I'd stop wearing clothes because I was, I was tired of washing my clothes every other day. And I think all of us, especially today have those days, you know, where it's difficult to get up and, and think as much as we can talk about what is happening outside and we are also going through our own guilt and helplessness and you know we are I mean there is a lot of beating that we are taking mentally as well even though this is a luxury you know compared to what is happening mm -hmm. elsewhere but but it's a very human thing to experience emptiness like you're saying and and in the end I don't think that there is any any answer to your question except that you have to just hope for a good day and then pick up on that and go with it. In the end, photography becomes a very uh, physical act. You have to kind of, you can't just be thinking about things. You have to also be making photographs. Um, I mean, that I'm talking now in a very practical way. And we also can't just be ideating and philosophizing and in the end, you know, if there's a musician, the musician's also making music. If there's a writer, the writer's also making, you know, writing. Uh, similarly, for a photographer, you know, I think it's important to go with the flow. But at the same time, if you just go on with the flow, you might go into the sea and get lost somewhere. But you have to kind of also uh, go with the flow and 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 um, and pluck yourself out of it at some point of time. And that is something that you have to figure out. I don't have an answer. You know? I don't think anybody else will. Um, how to learn there's to do... Oh, sorry, okay. yeah. Go no, ahead. No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there, was, there was a question um, uh, about your dog, Elsa. If you could speak a little bit about Elsa. Uh, so, so when I was, when I was about, what, 17, 18? No, yeah, it was... Uh, I had a few breakups for the same person and in the final breakup when she dumped me she dumped me and gave me Elsa so I was stuck with this pup and we had a goodbye and then I was like what the hell you know like what am I doing with a pup uh, so, so it was a bit of a funny situation and I remember I'd gone back home to my mum's and uh, like both my mum and I, we love dogs, even my dad, but my mum and I have always loved animals and, you know, the house has all been full of animals. But somehow after losing the previous dogs, um, um, like my mum didn't want to go through that loss again, you know, and, and, and it also happened because I was in a boarding school. So she had to kind of deal with the loss and also to kind of tell me about the loss when, you know, um, I was 13 or something where obviously I'm not going to care about how she had to deal with it. I was like, why did you let her die, you know, and let him die at that time. So she didn't want to go through it. And I remember um, I ha the dog was dumped on me after I also got dumped. And, and um, I took the dog back and, uh, and my mom immediately was like, no way, no way, no way am I going to keep this. You know, and, and um, yeah, it was also after she had recovered. So my mom was sick. And then after that, she had recovered. And, and somehow Elsa just kind of came into her life at the right moment through a very sort of a funny situation. And, and for the first two days, you know, like my mom was like, no way am I going to keep this dog. And I remember the first meal she had, she kind of, the bowl, because we didn't have like a bowl for a pup. So we just gave her a bowl and uh, she was trying to kind of um, sort of lean into the bowl and somehow she did a handstand. Like it happens with a lot of pups because the muscles are not fully developed and she kind of, her body was inside the bowl and her legs were sticking up and we both ended up laughing a lot, my mom and me. And I think that was 
how she kind of broke the ice and um obviously like in the end what ended up happening was that that was a period where i was going to you know i was studying in college and 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 at the same time i was trying to escape from home and and um i took off traveling and and somehow my mum was uh, quite pissed off with me for sort of leaving her with the dog and um of course i was there to to kind of uh enjoy the dog but uh, somehow not do the dirty work as such you know and and it be- like elsa kind of in a way became my mum's companion you know and 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 uh, she lived a long life um but at the same time i think uh, i noticed that her sort of demeanor her personality a lot of it would also be affected by how my mom was feeling so i think she absorbed a lot of um the stress um from my mom you know and and um somehow i don't think i could have gone by this sort of period without her and even when i'm publishing my books you know it, this thought just came to me quite recently because i had to do this um somehow with this whole covid situation i was thinking that there's going to be one moment of break and now i can actually relax as well and just you know use this situ- because usually i'm always struggling to make excuses and to not meet people and now everyone wants to be in zoom so um so thing is that um on because i had another talk not too long ago um which was around publishing it was a aperture and uh, not aperture it was with um in this photo book sort of fair um i was thinking about why i started to publish you know uh, all i remember from the time when elsa died was that um i didn't feel uh, i was quite cold i felt that i didn't I was quite numb and I think I had to kind of take care of Elsa I had to kind of uh out of my mum and me be the one who is not breaking down because my mum was breaking down I had to kind of take her to the doctor also be clear you know in talking in terms of whether she needed to be put down to to know that I was making certain decisions you know in clarity and not have regrets later you know uh, in terms of making a certain decision because you kind of the do- the doctor says one day that you know i think it'll be better for her to be put down and then suddenly you see elsa kind of sensing it and 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 kind of getting up you know and being full of life and then you're like okay hold on maybe not now so because there was all this sort of mental and emotional knots that i was getting tied up in i was somehow trying to be as numb about things as possible and then elsa just in a way i think she made it she really lightened the burden on us in the way she died uh, i remember all the other dogs from the street also kind of came to the house they all kind of knew something was happening they all were kind of at the gate on the driveway because um you know like all the dogs are fed at home and and um somehow uh i remember that the moment she died i got everything done it was a bit weird also because what to do with the body and then i got to know that there is a crematorium for animals took it to the crematorium where um uh it was a hindu ceremony for a dog you know so you have like a cremation going on for a dog you have an electric crematorium for dogs and the person takes some water i don't know whether tap water or ganga jal or whatever you know and they chirkoing they kind of sprinkling the the body with uh, the thing and mm, i was on my own but it, 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 i was also very aware that all of it was a bit weird and i think i was expected to kind of feel good that the other family member in my you know in in, in the form of a dog was going through the same sort of passage ritual passage but i remember i was felt very disconnected from myself so i was able to kind of step out of myself and look at the whole process and also look at myself being really um really um blank and for a long time i i felt that um maybe there is some sort of baggage that i've uh i'm someone who doesn't talk much about all of this and i felt that 
um maybe it's hidden somewhere and one day it's going to come and punch me in the face unexpectedly so i was quite worried but then in retrospect i realized that you know for me publishing kind of became um an act of grieving because the moment she died i immediately wanted to publish the book that i'd been waiting to publish for a long time and i wanted to call it ugly dog you know because i couldn't think of any name beyond that and she was really really ugly uh, which means adorable but cute you know so um there was a sort of a sentiment in 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 kind of putting forward a tribute and it all seemed really silly but somehow it was something that i i kind of feel that became a sort of a ritual you know and i think this makes more sense to me because in the last few years i've attended a few funerals a few cremations where i see how like i'm a bystander always and i see how um how like the people the family you know which is going through the real grief is always taken through a sort of a passage a ritual passage you will have like somehow nobody knows what to do but there will always be like some really far off distant family member or someone who takes on the responsibility to kind of take you through you'll see someone holding something with you know uh with you and taking you making you do something or you, even the priest or you know whatever ritual whatever if, uh, sort of uh last rites it is that one might perform but that's what i watched like this piece kind of instructing and and people kind of without thinking doing because it needs to be done but i feel like the ritualistic element in it somehow somehow leads to some sort of closure you know there is a lot of grieving but somehow there's also a different kind of closure that comes in over there in my case it became publishing what kind of paper because it became about personality of a book you know so even to kind of order mylar from the uk and then to kind of sit at home and to also kind of um um for you know cover all the book uh, the the sort of uh, dust jackets myself you know where it's not just me getting an end product but in a way like each thing that i'm sort of making i'm kind of putting it together so i think Mm, it would always lead me into a sort of zone of um of um relief of some sorts and i remember i done the first book and then immediately the book kind of uh became successful in a sort of a commercial way i guess it sold and um there was this expectation from many people for me to kind of make the next one immediately because you know it's got a paid book um to it and um people were talking about the business of it and it would do well and just how i can package it but i just wanted to down all of that out and feel like i could live with with the second book you know because the first book i had started making in 2009 i only published in 2015 and i think it was elsa's passing that became a trigger for me to go and do it myself because before that you always thinking how do i get this book published do i kind of contact a publisher you know uh, you're a bit lost about it but somehow that incident that passing triggered me to just take things into my own hands and so i knew exactly what to do i knew i was going to be self publishing i was going to you know be doing it on one paper which needed to smell a particular way somehow everything became sort of an emotional process and um, then i kind of waited for 3 years to make the second one in between i made a film i made sounds out of it um once i'd done the second book you know then there was this thing okay now somehow maybe i don't need to somehow it felt complete the whole role of ugly dog publishing ugly dog books had been you know fulfilled um so now what you know and then um then i felt like I know that it's kind of turned into something but I have built this idea maybe I should do one more so that it doesn't kind of become too much about its own self let me let me bring one more simply because I've started something little like this idea this sort of emotional resonance so then I 
published the course last year you know um i think what is happening is that this year for example i published the levy and now because of the whole covid situation i'm not really able to send it out so there's someone who's written to me and i'm not responded i apologize everything is going to get sorted after this and i'm anyway a bit lost but it's going to happen in time but but i realized that by january um i had become more sort of distant emotionally from that original sort of you know idea of publishing in terms of a grief you know uh and now i was able to think more in terms of um um in terms of um a publisher rather than someone who needed to kind of do a tribute you know and and for me i realized that when i started photography it came from a similar place where um it came more as a catharsis the whole act of making photographs came as a catharsis and the more i in time i became more of a photographer my relationship to photography also changed where it became a little more complex and very often complicated you know um and i see the same thing because of elsa you know the catharsis came with the publishing part and i see the same thing today where um where um the the more sort of complicated or complex relationship with publishing comes in now where i also feel like december was very easy for me to make the book you know i just didn't care i just said yeah this needs to be done and somehow it might sound brutal but i think it was just more like muscle memory and uh, somehow i wasn't feeling that emotional grandeur um as i did in the beginning so i mean thanks for asking me about elsa because it gives me i think in a way like she was a dog but a lot of who i am today is kind of to do with you know her in many ways and i mean she's there in 10 years of my work as well and and in a way um so i like the fact i mean photographers also become so serious you know everything is about and i, I kind of i like the fact that elsa has given me something really stupid to kind of you know make grand and and i i i am quite happy about what she's given me so uh before we take on uh more questions uh, we have jaising ana with us mm-hmm. and uh, i have given him permission to speak so he can say a few words about his experiences with you oh my god hi sir up wait how can i see him can i see him no uh, okay fine speak speak i've seen you enough anyway yeah hi sir up how are you <laughs> i'm good <laughs> Yeah. So the, yeah, they asked me to come for uh, they say they connect with me. I don't know what to what to talk, but anyway, just remember that a lot of people are listening to you. So say something <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah. So I was like uh, going back to yeah, like I think I'm not wrong. 2013, I met you. I met you in Chennai, and you saw my pictures and you said yeah, you like um, you said you saw the work and you said yeah, this you are really good at uh, composition and very classical style, but you. we have to look at what things happening around the world what is photography is happening in around the world so that that really that makes me um I think a lot if he told me that if you want to go to be in a, uh, like a uh so yeah that meetings makes me uh, uh, ask me so many questions about what i'm doing and uh, uh, things uh, self questioning about then again uh, 2015 I, i i i came to angkor and the workshop i remember very clearly uh, first day i made two three two three story about uh, night life and then there is a folklore thing then you asked me like uh, night life you can do it do it in madurai also you can do it in chennai also um, uh, then uh, the folklore thing also you can do it anywhere this the work is more like illustrated i want to more about you why you want to take photograph and uh, why you, uh, so those makes me now uh, uh, looking back my roots and uh, look up look at right now i'm doing about my lockdown phase i'm doing a story about home so those are the uh, questions made me now look at myself and uh, i'm uh, so those those are the very important thing to me for uh, uh, going back to my room uh, my, my grandmother story uh, my childhood things so those are the questions whether you asked me in the very first time and angkor thing so really now i'm find try, try to find out who i am and try to make meaningful photography something like that yeah so 
That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I'm so, ten, I'm tense now. You can ask some question I can okay. talk so, or maybe yeah. So, so the thing is as I was saying, this is the yeah. problem with photographers. It becomes about yeah. photography, you know, but okay. just to just to kind of say that um I mean um what jessing and all don't realize is that there's something very special happening i feel that there's something quite special happening in tamil nadu uh, especially um you know when i came in 2013 and i'd heard of sentil who's also seems to have asked a question about contemporary photography um but the thing is no matter how much uh, they make it about photography i feel like there is so much richness to them as people you know to them to all the people who are in jara you know through the two pradeshnis who are here i met one of them only once in 2013 um but um i mean i don't have an answer for you because you never asked a question you just gave a comment about photography and and um but the thing is that uh, i mean what do i say to this i mean can you help me with, <laughs> with answering <laughs> jaise so yeah i mean i think honestly um one thing i would ask people to be aware of uh, okay and to be wary of is that i mean i don't personally i don't have an answer for you all and also you have to like i'm very awkward about this these days because i am very conscious that i'm coming from delhi i'm coming from a certain place of privilege and i'm kind of trying to influence uh when we have these conversations i'm trying to influence how one can change their photography but very often you know i feel like um people who are kind of directing or telling or you know um are trying to kind of give a sense of what referring to centers question what contemporary photography is are all coming from a place of privilege you know and in a way i feel like you all have to kind of like someone like you you have to kind of tell me your story rather than you listening to me and making a story according to that uh, i don't know if that makes sense but i also feel like if you're listening to me too much there's something wrong in it mm I hope don't sound that disappointed. <laughs> It's supposed to make you feel good about what you want to do, but um, just don't listen to me too much. Okay. Yes. Okay. A uh, couple of other questions. Hmm. There's one about. Uh, Bruce Lee and the idea of taking the shape of water is one of the points that you said is affected the way you see photography. So, how do you connect that with photography, martial arts with photography? I mean, uh, Bruce Lee was very philosophical, and I think um, at a time when he was trying to put forward, you know, the philosophy of Jeet Kune Do, where he was trying to take elements from different sort of structures of you know different elements of martial arts um at a time where each school was competitive with each other um he tried to kind of make something new with the best what he thought was the best of all rather than saying that any one thing is definite i think in the end now getting away from bruce lee um in the end uh, the further i kind of the longer time i spend um uh, i mean uh, the as time passes um the one thing i realize is that i'm smaller th- than i realized you know um uh, in this world and it's not that i'm kind of growing smaller it's just that my horizons are kind of getting bigger and bigger and i think that um i'm kind of realizing that the more baggage i'm letting go of um being like a fixed person it's not just about photography i think it's just about who you are right the more sort of baggage i think one lets go of one realizes that there was so much that 
was not visible uh, before to you. And in that sense, I, I feel like I'm getting smaller, not necessarily that I'm feeling smaller or like, you know, it's making me feel it's discouraging. In fact, it's quite encouraging because I just feel like my playing field is getting bigger. You know, the more I kind of let go of a lot of these dogmas and, and I think that's what happens with a lot of um, when you're trying to specialize in something. And I think some, it's a balance. Sometimes doing everything at the same time or doing a, different things can also sometimes you can, you can start making excuses to yourself as well. But it's more about finding a sort of an equilibrium. And, and uh, I felt that my equilibrium had started to shift out of the sort of a vessel that I had occupied at one time, whether you want to call it a vessel of photography or whatever, I felt like somehow I could see my equilibrium fall outside. So how could I also kind of remain in that same vessel? You know, I had to kind of spill out of it and, 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 and reach out elsewhere as well. So, and this is something I feel uh, it's more of an inward thing and not necessarily that it needs to manifest itself, uh, in the outside bit, you know, like in my case, sure, like I'm now trying to do, I'm trying to sort of work with still images, I'm trying to work with video and whatever. But in the end, for me, they all are images, even text and sound. Are. So my core is still images. Is These are just things that it's spilling over. And if you imagine like a bucket full of water, um, full to the brim, and then imagine these vibrations that are happening and there is, you know, water kind of spilling out. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what spills out, but the vibration is happening from within me, you know? Um, and, and in a way, um, I think it's not just about, you know, the water that spills out, but it's also about the vibration. So it's, uh, it's being in touch also with myself as who I am and, and um, also kind of kind of being rooted uh, or being grounded by what I'm doing. So it's a mix of both. And, and it's about kind of having my feet in different places, one place which can give me the independence to experiment, to try to make mistakes. And the other foot can be in a place which keeps me more grounded, you know, where I can feel the pulse of... Um, um, where I'm existing, you know, where I can get like a reality check of some sorts. And, 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 uh, yeah, for me, I think it's, it's that in that way that I kind of connect to, uh, what Bruce Lee talked about because he talks about being like water so that, because water can fill up any vessel and take the shape of that vessel, you know, uh, and he talks, there's this looseness that I think. I really uh, feel the need for at the moment. And I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of it, but I feel like it can be so much more. But the looseness is not just in the form that kind of comes out, but looseness is also in who I am as a person because I'm someone began from a lot of place um, with maybe, uh, you know, my own sort of uh, biases. But it's not like my biases are kind of, disappearing maybe one bias gets replaced by another one you know uh, so as much as i'm trying to break free out of the sort of uh, box that i'm in i constantly find myself uh jumping into a slightly bigger box but i'm still within a box and i think my whole life i'm going to remain in some box or the other it's just that i hope that it gets a little bigger so that my arms are able to kind of move around you know, I'm able to maneuver the box in a different way. And um, I feel like if I get totally out of the box, I won't know what to do. So in a way, um, I'm, I'm more interested in this longer sort of um, breaking out of the box. So even like many years ago, um, it's with Invisible Photography Asia. I think for the first time, I'd articulated this process of building building something and then destroying it and then building it again, you know. Uh, I think it's also to do with not just growing, 
but also to do with um, finding vulnerability of some sorts because I feel that um, the more work that I do, the more I might get acknowledged, the more I kind of, I would say, collect. Uh, you know, when I first started photo photography, I think I was working in a way where I had everything at stake and nothing to lose. And that was also a time where I felt, uh, the first time I, I still remember that feeling of um, um, being in a place where everything was hopeless and then me just saying, okay, if it's so hopeless, let me just take a really big risk and do something which seems risky at the moment. And I did it. I don't remember the exact thing that I did, but I remember the feeling of it working out quite easily and, and me realizing, wow, okay, this is actually, this was quite easy. Let me try again, you know, and then I did it again and it was still really easy. And I started to realize that photography was much easier or whatever, you know, like uh, was much easier than I'd realized. It's just that it needs time. So, you know, when I read something like Sentel's question about documentary photography versus contemporary photography, to be honest, uh, I don't really know in terms of what, like at the moment, I don't div divide things as well because I know that everything is a cycle. So uh, right now, maybe people are looking at everything in, you know, in a sort of a contemporary photography way. But I'm sure like at some point of time when people are seeking more of an emotional connect, more to connect with reality, maybe documentary photography will have its own thing, you know? Uh, so... I've never surfed in my life, but I always imagine this analogy of surfing where, you know, I imagine myself in the water on a surfboard paddling and um, a lot of waves kind of coming and the waves, you know, always taking people, you know, by my side and the wave never really coming to me at the moment. I'm still waiting. I'm still kind of my hands and all are still in the water and legs and I'm paddling about. Um, but if I was to kind of start to paddle towards where the wave went, there's a big chance that I might reach that place, but the wave will come where I was, you know? So I feel the whole, what I'm, what I'm trying to do with my own self is I don't want to chase what is the trend or is contemporary photography the trend or documentary photography. I'm more concerned with what I'm doing. Maybe at some point in time, the wave comes to me. Maybe it does not. But the thing is that I don't want to just be chasing after one, chasing one trend after the other. And when I look at someone like Sentel's work, I think it's uh, what I really admire in the work is that right from the start, there's been a very strong commitment to, you know, I mean, he likes to, for everything, he just says man-animal conflict, which is bizarre for me because I think that his, work is really com more complex than that but yeah you know this whole notion of how humans are actually um, destroying the natural environment because somehow he might do tiger man conflict elephant man conflict but somehow the notion of man the human being is always a constant there and even when i visit him in his house or you know talk to him it's not just about photography for him, you know, it's, it's his life, it's his passion. Like he's someone who excitedly will tell me about how he rescued a snake and somehow it was taken to a rescue center. And, you know, his kids seem to be really excited by their father being, you know, uh, being this animal person and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, in a way, like, I feel like the wave will come to him. Maybe not now, maybe right now, uh, people are kind of, you know, trying to project whether the work is contemporary, not contemporary. But the wave will come to someone in time if Central continues to work, you know, for the rest of his life. And it might come late. And I think sometimes we do need acknowledgement and, you know, something to, maybe that one moment of acknowledgement that makes us go ahead. But that is a sad state of things that not everyone gets it. But I hope that someone like him continues. But at the same time, also challenges himself, you know, uh, in which he is. I mean, all the time he's showing me what he's doing with drones and so on. And 
and i think for me all of this gets tied up to that idea of um you know um whether you want to be like water or the looseness of it uh it's also like you could be in the same vessel throughout but should you choose to be you know as long as you know that you are taking the shape of this vessel that you're in um and and it could be looser than that Mm. This is a question about your rooftop series. Mm-hmm. Um, your rooftop series was bordering on voyeurism, mm-hmm. with your lens encroaching the private space of people, reducing them to mere subjects in your perspective. Mm-hmm. What is your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, honestly speaking, photography is a voyeuristic uh, thing. I mean, I don't need to. um I, i mean this is something that i have come to terms with ages ago that um we are all voyeurs even we being viewers of photography you know and i think i think um uh i mean that's the complex part about photography i think because um i don't think there's anything right wrong and i don't think i associate morality with uh voyeurism blankly it depends on the context uh my my rooftop was more about my rooftop because i am being a voyeur because i think that um i've been alone now for two and a half months and uh, i haven't seen any friends family um and i am kind of hungry for touch and i am kind of hungry about other people's lives and for me it's a very human sort of um you know response and and uh, you know people say we are we like people watching whether you're sitting in a park that is voyeurism uh what i'm doing is i'm acknowledging the state that i'm in where i'm kind of looking and 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 i think what you see in the rooftop photographs is just a glimpse of in fact i could be more voyeuristic you know uh but 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 somehow this relationship for me is um but but the thing is everyone else is also on their rooftops but what you're trying to see is also just from my sort of rooftop you know and i think we all are making sense of the world by watching and very often watching turns into voyeurism and we don't it's a, it's, a, it's a very gray area and um what i'm doing here consciously is that i have to kind of really um really really kind of um put the voyeurism to the forefront because i would be lying if i was um, not doing it i mean the work wouldn't make sense to me i mean even if i can call it work because for me that was that ritual of going up to my rooftop every day at 6 in the evening when it got a bit cooler you know that's why i asked you all to also kind of um prepone the stock because um I think that's the way for me to survive right now to have some sort of sanity to kind of give me something that kind of exists and at the same time I have to tell you something that I am also being watched you know and and it's more complex than just the photographer being the voyeur you know uh, it's also the photographer and I'm very open like I'm also sent by the way I'm also sending like we have this conversation with some of the rooftop neighbors uh, where you know uh i have to take photographs of the family like a family photograph from far and i have to kind of send it uh to them but yet in many of my photographs i'm not going to choose those photos i'm going to choose a different perspective because it's also about constructing a gaze a constructing you know a perspective and and uh representation perspective all of these things can also be constructs you know but because we are always hinting at reality but it's never really a true uh you know opening up into reality in that sense okay. um, when when did you shift from like social documentaries to creating visual journals of your own life and personal relationships and why and what was it like uh for you to be your own subject in that sense so yeah um i think somewhere around 2005 2006 
um i was in this um you know I, i'd gone to shivpuri which is a district in in mp and i remember i had stayed in the uh, i stayed overnight in the office of an organization that i'd been co- connected to uh i got a grant to work on employment and livelihood issues and you know because of my uh, association with the right to food program i got into this network larger network uh, umbrella network of theirs and i had a lot of support system that took me to these places and for the rest of the year i kind of uh, went to kalingnagar where you had the pos- you know you had the tata steel you had firing like there was they taken over land and it was still in dispute and people had come to protest and and uh, the police had fired in discriminately and 13 people had died i think in the 14th one died in the hospital and i was they went to the posco area in paradeep in odisha and then i went back to party where i've been going back for so many years but there was this one moment i think i still remember it was october october 2016 because my birthday is in october so it was around then where um, i'd gone to shipuri and i stayed the night there and then i'd taken a bus to the neighboring district called shiopur which is i think bordering baran in uh, in rajasthan and in the 1990s and early 2000s that was the baran and shiopur were like the most uh, famine affected regions and and i decided to go there simply because in most of the places where i had been to there were these grassroots level movements that were taking place like party where i go to is it's a pretty um they have sanghatans there you know um and you have madhuri ban and you have like jagrat adivasi dalit sanghatan that's been working there and and these places are what we call jagrat you know um and 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 uh, shiopur there was none, none of that so i kind of gone to this one village which someone had pointed me out to where like 30 kids had died out of malnourishment um, the week before i'd gone and i found a family that had lost three kids you know in different phases to malnourishment and they'd got one kid who had a really big distended belly like seemed extremely uh, malnourished and and um, i mean what had already been happening was around 2005 and all i was feeling very strange about going to places and not really finding an outlet for photographs because there was no social media at that time and the internet was quite young and a lot of my learning happened on uh, on the internet on this one forum called trek earth which was an amazing forum amazing people in there but at the same time there's also someone from tamil nadu called suchitra vijayan who was you know i met her for the first time on trek earth and now she runs something called the polis project which you all should check out um but you know it was still much slower and wasn't as urgent as the stories that needed to be put out and um i wasn't getting any access into publishing stories because nobody was interested in this you know and i've never reached out to a to an editor except one time when i reached out to someone in france because in india there was no avenues at the helka was supposed to do something they didn't do it and um that lady wrote to me saying the photographs are really nice but can you show something more contemporary like bollywood or you know like india shining because that there was around the time it was right after the whole india shining days and that really sort of broke something um because i ended up feeling asking myself if i was um making photographs just for myself if i was making photographs for an audience that already knew of these issues like a lot of people who were activists and all they wanted me to continue taking it and um but they already knew these stories so who are, who was i taking it for you know so regarding that work even this question of who i was taking it for was kind of coming about and then the october moment really broke broke it completely simply because i was there telling this family trying to be really honest saying that because you know people are very generous uh, in opening up their lives and 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 they would they were they thought that i might it might change their life and i had to tell them that it's not going to do anything but maybe in a longer conversation at some point of time it might affect something in it's just a conversation and that's something so unfair and 
and abstract to kind of put forward in that situation. And this was still when I was about 23, 24, and I was beginning to feel more and more that if I really wanted to make a difference, I should be a doctor. What am I doing here, taking photographs and going back and for a grant? And, you know, and then going back to my own, like going back to meet my friends, it's my birthday, let's go out, get a drink. So this whole thing of going to these spaces, coming back to my own, that was getting really jarring. And then also kind of being more and more aware because I tried to photograph my mum once and I felt I was, I was doing something wrong. There was just this feeling that creeped up on me. I felt like I was stealing something. So that whole notion of voyeurism actually came in with my mum, you know. But then, to be honest, as much as I tried to convince myself that I was actually being quite protective of my mother, that is why I felt something. I think it was more to do with me being protective of my own self because I was the one who was actually feeling vulnerable and not um, uh, not about so much about my mom because I felt like looking at my mom, someone would judge me, you know, my life. So there were these different sort of thoughts that were coming about. And then also this other relationship with photography that I was feeling where, um, um, you know, it's also about power. So maybe we can take voyeurism and also kind of extend it to this notion of power. You know, who is the one who is taking photographs? And um, very often these conversations become about the making of the photographs, you know, whether it's made properly, not made. And the making of it, for me, I'm actually more skeptical today of photographs that look politically correct because political correctness for me is a vocabulary that I can very easily you know, construct. So I can make a photograph look like I'm an extremely sensitive photographer and, you know, I've been extremely concerned and so on. And because I know I can do it, I'm also quite skeptical when I see other things happening. And I'm aware that the real sort of meaning of images lies in how it's put out, where it's put out, you know, uh, what context it kind of gets consumed in. And I know that many of those things are far bigger than me and it's out of my control, but it becomes more important for me to control that. Then, then it also makes me think that accountability, as much as I can go and be respectful in the place where I'm taking those photographs, how can that accountability get extended on to me going back to my city into a very different privileged space and doing whatever I want with those images? There's nobody to kind of question me. Even if at that moment I'm trying to explain to them what I'm doing. Also, these things, it's not about I mean, I'm not trying to say one is wrong, it's right, wrong, but I'm just trying to say the whole process is so complex because I also don't know what I'm going to do after 10 years. And, and also how time in itself becomes a, a sort of a context in itself because which keeps changing because what might seem right today might seem totally wrong tomorrow, depending on the larger conversations that are happening in society or the world or even within you. You know, you might, and I think it's really amazing about photography to open, open me up to these different conversations. You know, I might have liked a photographer before, but today I think that it's such a, such a weird way in which the person has looked at, you know, the uh, people who that photographer has photographed, you know, and I'm not comfortable with it. So I think it's also me growing as a person, but me also realizing in a different way and my take, my, that October moment made it very clear for me that I would like to actually start looking at my mum and not be in denial of it because I realized it was very easy for me to go to a village and photograph another mother who had lost a child looking really miserable as opposed to me photographing my own mother who might be feeling miserable because of her illness, you know. So I realized that I was also kind of uh, making specific choices, even if it was not, I hadn't really thought about it um, consciously. I felt like there were these other factors where even being a photographer is a privilege, it's being protective. We always, we're never really showing a part of ourselves which is more vulnerable, but it's very easy for us to kind of tap into someone else's vulnerability. So that made me want to kind of look inwards in a way to be able to earn my right to look outwards so i had stopped 
taking the images outside because I felt that I needed to do this one thing first. I needed to kind of confront whatever I was doing um, to then be able to kind of have some clarity, you know, to be of conscience. Then I could kind of go back to those villages and make make those photographs, you know, because I know that it's never really the same thing, you know. I mean, there's a big world of a difference between you know my mother and like a mother in those in the village over there who's lost a child, but it was just my attempt at trying to seek some sort of um, justification about why I should go there, you know. So, um, I mean, these things keep happening to me because to somewhere towards the end of life is elsewhere. Uh, I mean, I made a book, gave it to my mom, not towards life is elsewhere, but like 2009 ish. Um, I happened to make a book because I didn't have a uh, computer. I didn't have a laptop at that time, and the laptop that I'm using right now is from 2009. The same laptop, you know. So, I was supposed to go somewhere, and 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 um, I was asked to get work. So I could only make a book, and that was the first time I wrote something. Um, and I hope that this answers some of some of the other questions which are about my mom. I'm just connecting some of them together. Um, you know. So that was the first time I wrote about how I felt, like whether I was embarrassed by how I saw my mom, at moments I felt a certain hatred towards her, you know, but at the same time I also wrote about how I appreciated everything else. Um, and I gave it to my mom for the first time and I was quite scared that that might kind of, um, um, you know, um, uh, it might uh, make her flare up again because very often schizophrenia, uh, the episodes, you know, it all kind of would take off on certain triggers. And I, did, I was hoping that my giving her the book and my having written something was not a trigger of some sort. So, um, and then I also thought that it's a test of my accountability. You know, that question of my mother being in that same space will tell me that she hates it, you know. Uh, and, and, and so I was at that time very idealistic about it. And I felt like this is the sort of moment where... I need to be tested and, and you know, like I've given up a certain kind of photography for so many years. This is 2009 and I stopped making those photographs in 2006 because I felt like this home space is the place where I'm going to, you know, have accountability. And there were only three photographs of my mom because I was still quite bothered about taking her photographs. And, and, um, and uh, when I gave her the book, uh, I remember I'd gone to a different room and I was packing and and because I was supposed to leave the next day uh, I had to leave India for Europe the next day and and um, I kind of my mom came to me she gave me a hug she said she loved it this that was beautiful and and I was very confused because I was like but I thought you would hate it you know and and then I realized that no matter how ugly I might have made her look in a situation being my mother she would still love it because of the relationship with me and and um, you know I that whole idea of finding accountability at that moment felt so silly but what was good was that I found a different space I kind of reached a different place with it you know and I found other things along the way and then somewhere towards the end I also started to realize by 2012 that uh, that you know um, um, I had already begin, begun to, this was, this was supposed to be like this autobiographical stream of consciousness way of working, but I started to kind of realize how I knew exactly what image to make, and this is something I mentioned before. And at the same time, I was working with children and um, in Cambodia, and they would come back with these broken photographs, you know, the non-photographic photographs. And... Um, and you know, um, I was really, I was very affected by them, and that made me realize how I was being so much of a photographer. I was so stiff, whereas the kids were were uh, just moving about so freely, you know, so in such a carefree way. And the baggage of a photographer wasn't there. So you know, in the beginning, it talked about me being a photographer is the one that is destroying my photography is this realization that came working with kids because 
um, of this not having that baggage to have that complete freedom, you know, which today I can connect the kids to the idea of Bruce Lee and water, you know, and I can take it further to something else. But sticking to that and also bringing in this whole vo voyeuristic aspect, I mean, of course, I also re realized that they didn't have these filters, you know, whereas very often as a photographer before in Life is Elsewhere, I was... For the sake of my own vulnerability, I was creating these surrealistic photographs, which you're still being a warrior, but but you're thinking more about the photography. You know, so in a way, I was I used the photography in it more as a as a shield for to protect myself. So then I started to kind of confront the home environment a lot more and. I wanted to sort of work without any filters. And in my work, people can be warriors. In the end, the whole idea is to kind of also make a family album that's not really, you know, very often family albums, which don't feel voyeuristic, but they feel really nostalgic. If you look carefully, they're also projections of aspirations. You know, like you might have I come across people who might talk about how the family was quite broken, but somehow within the family albums, you you might imagine that everyone was in love and, you know, there's something quite beautiful and nostalgic about it. But very often these family albums were also about our own projections. But in reality, everything is a projection, you know. So I wanted to actually give a more, give put forward a family album without many of these filters. That in itself becomes some sort of a projection. But the person who's watching it also becomes a warrior into my, my space. So going back now, connecting it to that question about the rooftop and the warrior, I feel this thing of being a warrior, warrior and doing something voyeuristic, I feel is way more complex today. You're on social media very often. You know, you're going through other people's feeds just because it's public. Does it not take away from the fact? I mean, does it not mean that you're still some sort of a warrior looking at what is happening, you know? So we all kind of tapping into different worlds. In the end, writers also warriors very often. They're studying people. They're looking into people's lives, even though they might just pick certain elements and turn the characters into someone else. You know, so I don't think warriorism just remains at the level of the photographs that one sees. I think the photographs are just residues, like I was mentioning, of a certain experience, of a certain state of being. But but voyeurism is like, I would think of voyeurism more as a network of uh, communication, of this invisible communication where if I'm on my rooftop, I think all of us are watching, all of us are looking. We're not just in our own little sort of spaces. All of us are also showing, you know? So, for example, in my work, the person with, who's kind of swinging his daughter up and who's gymming, he really wants to, he, he insists that I take his photographs. At the same time, you have a lot of neighbors who see me taking photographs. And they see me, you know, like I, I make it quite obvious that I'm taking the photographs around. They're very aware. And I think the dynamics is more complex than me just photographing them. I think I'm also trying to nudge this feeling of voyeurism. So I might take a photograph and they're not looking. I might take a photograph that seems like it's a certain hidden perspective that I'm kind of at night going through a window and I'm looking. I mean, that window where I might be showing, actually, it could have an old gentleman who comes up every evening, he shows me an amazing smile and I'm taking a photograph and he's on his phone, he's waving out when I'm taking photographs. But then he goes back inside and he knows I'm outside taking photographs. You know, it's a little more complex than, is this voyeuristic, not voyeuristic? But for me, it's really interesting because um, I see that because I, for me, rooftops become these islands. And I think all of us right now are existing on our own sort of islands in many ways. But we are aware of ourselves being in isolation. But at the same time, we are very aware of what we are trying to kind of reach out onto the other island as well. You know, so uh, for me, voyeurism is more like this very interesting network, which kind of goes beyond just image making, you know, the image making is more like me trying to manipulate you all into reaching that space where one can
talk about voyeurism you know and because if i don't talk about it in a way i can't i have to also bring in my own loneliness being on my own over here you know what's my psychological state of being over here i just don't want to take beautiful photographs of rooftop with a nice sunset and birds flying uh and then just say this is a rooftop and i'm alone i have to kind of sort of funnel your gaze into a certain perspective that feels voyeuristic you know so i need to i mean even this whole thing of the coast you know um uh for me i'm very aware that in a way the coast also has a very intrusive feeling but i'm able to construct that intrusive feeling i'm also very aware of the fact that i'm a not indian photographer i mean even though the written story is based in tamil nadu it's to do with mostly the larger coastline but i i'm i'm aware of the idiot photographer in the story is uh who wants to go and photograph madhu the woman who had lo- whose head had been stolen because you know it's a sensational thing so the very act of photographing a sensational thing i have to acknowledge it because i'm part of the violence as well you know and and then i'm in the story madhu it says that the photographer came photographer came uh through chennai you know um and in the 12th story it says the photographer came from chennai so i'm also playing on these small little narrative shifts that are taking place and then um, madhu remarks while talk to him that he has a strange accent so i'm just also alluding to the fact that the photographer is an outsider as well because i'm aware of you know like for me i mean me going to tamil nadu working there the whole time i'm very conscious that i'm an outsider there's no way i'm going to kind of tap into the specific you know undercurrents i mean i'm can try and feel the pulse of what is happening but in a way for me through my short story i also wanted to kind of allude to these larger sort of um politics that plays out even in image making you know because it's very easy to say the white old in the old white man photographer syndrome who kind of comes and photographs in india i feel like in many ways i am that old white man photographer in other places but so are many of us you know who are the people we kind of are voyeuristic towards and i mean do we feel voyeuristic right now because i'm photographing people from a similar socio economic bracket as opposed to me literally going and stepping into people's lives where they don't really might not have a choice to say no to me i assume that i'm there but you might think that that's a very sensitively taken photograph but you don't know how i went to that space so for me i think these are the interesting things when um like i'm the whole all these conversations around representation very often uh, remain on the surface it's about representation i'm more interested when these conversations around representation voyeurism you know anything that's related to how an image looks feels also kind of opens up into how an image might have been made you know how an image might have been put forward in a different context and that's where the you know the more sort of uh complex conversations for me begin and and um simply and the reason why I'm, i like i know voyeurism is a construct as well i can create the gaze so i'm quite happy that someone here felt that because it means that maybe something was kind of working in a way um i'm not going to speak more i can just allow someone to uh chip in and if you feel like there's an, a different question that might uh um, yeah um one second i also so talk a lot actually, i'm sorry about that sorry? i'm i also talk a lot so i'm sorry about that i think we're all really glad that you have spoken so um detachment from photography is what i'm looking for only so that i can enter that space further so how do you detach from something while being within it yeah i mean um you asking me such a heavy philosophical question uh it's just i think for me maybe it's constantly asking myself what my intent is uh, with every decision that i'm making you know or even if i'm not making that particular decision but if something has come in why am i choosing to allow to kind of for it to happen whether it's to do with my uh the 
what I end up finding as a topic or growing into a topic. Why am I doing this work? You know, what are my reasons for being here? Um, wh- who am I? What is my position with regard to this? How is it connecting to the larger world? I think um, going back and forth is this uh, sort of uh, negotiating of these different walls. I feel starts to expand uh, the space within which I maneuver, and um, I think that allows me to somewhat step out of myself and to be able to have a larger understanding. Or I'm actually maybe not even stepping out of self uh, out of myself. I might imagine that I am, but maybe it's just that my um, questions or this the the space in which I'm kind of asking these questions and. Uh, and I'm using photography to ask these questions, but it could also be, you know, in real life, in terms of why am I choosing to vote in a particular way? You know, why am I choosing to behave in this way? Why am I choosing to, you know, um, to even do this talk at the moment? You know, uh, why did I agree to it or not? Um, am I just kind of doing it as a as my own publicity? You know, so that more people come and listen to me and. I get another excuse to kind of talk a lot and mansplain or whatever, you know. But it's um, I think I have to be very conscious of my reasons for doing things in as precise a way. And I'm I know for a fact that I'm limited. I'm I'm not going to manage to do it for everything. But it's more about asking myself the right the right questions, but also maybe as many questions, even if it's you know. Um, so I, I'm quite appreciative if someone is asking me the question about voyeurism because I think, in a way, I also have to kind of be aware of my own sort of position with regard to why I'm making certain choices. I'm at the moment quite. I've embraced the fact quite some time ago that um, the world, photography, my own existence, all of it is quite complex. You know uh, the way we move around and all these things and and in a way um, I'm able to answer certain questions at the moment and maybe tomorrow I might not be able to answer it also depends on how another factor kind of comes in um, so so I think for me this whole thing of stepping out maybe it's to do with this maybe I haven't really thought about it consciously in terms of how one does it it just so happened that um, I started to get more aware of things, and I was able to kind of um, maybe form exercises for myself, even in terms of the questions that I'm asking myself, or you know, um, maybe even some of the people here who I might have worked ha- worked with, who are photographers, who um, you know, these are the kind of questions that I would hope to ask them as well, because in the end. The last thing I would want them to do is to do something because that's what needs, that's what is the right thing to do, or what people expect them to do, or what I might say is good work or whatever. Because in the end, I think the work is something that they have to be able to take responsibility for, you know. And uh, even if someone's work troubles me, I will never ever take tell the person that it's bad work. You should not do it. It's more about this is what I feel, but. Are you able to take responsibility for it? I'm not sure, and I mean, I might have my own reservations against it, but I can never really, you know, it's that person's journey for me to really figure out why she or he is, you know, um, doing it in a, in a certain way. But um, we all have to figure out our own sort of, you know, uh, clarifications. So, as one of the last, the last question that we ask. Um, always during the sessions is if you could recommend five films or documentaries or and five books that for the youth for all of us oh my god so maybe 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 i'll just answer one question shortly because it seems to be it seems to say priyadarshini asked at 5 pm about humor mm-hmm. i'm going to ask it only because i think maybe it's the priyadarshini who photographs a garden i don't know so only for that you know um um i mean i mean yeah i mean for me humor is a tool uh, i think it's a tool to disarm people also in a way um i don't want to it's it's a tool also for myself to not take things too seriously 
you know so i'll keep it short simply because we are reaching the end uh, but i hope that kind of uh, answers you in some way you know uh, it's just a it's, a it's just a tool for me to use because i feel that i need to kind of cut through get through to people um, who might be you know have their defenses up and i feel like very often when we are trying to have a conversation um uh, very often there can be some wall that can be up and i think humor can be a way to kind of um break that but at the same time i also feel like i don't really like to just say humor because i think there's a whole range of humor uh it's more about a certain tone i would say that you might want to take so i don't really think of humor in isolation but more in terms of what's the tone of the work that needs to kind of touch someone in a particular way you know do i want someone to touch do do i want to touch someone in an aggressive way or more as a caress you know or more as a tap on the shoulder you know so i feel like it's a gesture in a way humor the the usage of it so so five books or um Oh my god. Uh you know like I think um at the moment I would say that on the Moma website it was supposed to be a secret for me but it's on the Moma website they have a list of um of of all these online screenings that are happening and I would actually recommend that entire list um simply because you know i don't think i in my mind there's not that one hierarchy it's more that you suddenly open yourself up to a lot of different short films a lot of different video work a lot of different longer films some of it you know a lot of it is for free and it's just that at this point of time somehow um a lot of people have made work available online you know and it may not happen again and i think that you must take advantage of it and see it because i also saw like um films by apichat pong vira satukul who i would kind of recommend obviously uh but you know i also got to see his films on on uh, um on through one of the one of the sites and uh um i mean in terms of uh, something contemporary and just entertainment i personally just watched uh, the last dance which i really enjoyed i know that i'm not saying anything intense and deep to you all but i grew up playing basketball and for me michael jordan was amazing in the 90s and i kind of cried as a kid when he retired for the first time and you know for me when he retired for the second time it really broke my heart so somehow it takes me back to my childhood and you know just with my association and uh, i think it's very it's it's one of the best documentaries that has been made to do with sports um i in sometimes when i would um when i would you know work with i don't know if karthik is here karthik subramanian but maybe he might remember that In 2012 or whenever when we did the workshop in Nepal, that's where I also screened uh, Zero Dreams of Sushi, um, which uh, was about this one really old sushi maker, and it's just about the rigor with which that old person is making sushi, and he's considered to be the national treasure in Japan. But somehow I felt that you know um, there was something quite um, it was quite um beautiful about about a certain a certain um discipline you know uh, and i felt like it could inspire even me as a photographer and and um i mean i love Mal- superman of malaga which is available on youtube so i also want to kind of tell you things that are easily available you know because i don't want to just say you know uh, to watch some iranian films and and apichat pong and you know any of that how many korean you can watch but also you can watch um um 
you know, Superman and Malagao, it is a fabulous, fabulous documentary. It's available on YouTube. I mean, I fell in love with it. Um, I was recently introduced to this Iranian writer called Ghulam Saidi. I mean, it's very easy to call every magical realism, but um, a lot of my friends in Iran told me that uh, he was extremely political and he was not, I mean, people from outside Iran don't really know of him. Um, I would I would love to obviously say Manto, but I would say Ismat Chuktai, because I think Ismat Chuktai never really gets looked at, and I think Lihaf uh, is quite an amazing, and you can find it online again. Uh, there is one online PDF available with the translation from Urdu. I think for me, what was quite amazing was um, the way she looked at sexuality in a certain, you know. Um, at a certain time, and and um, I feel like somehow we always talk about Manto, and I love the story Boo, but uh, we always talk about Manto, but somehow we don't talk as much about Isma Chuktai. Um, I think, um, you know, at the moment, I'm listening to a lot of music, and it could be electronic, it could be something else. I'm also listening to music by my friends because it's somewhat closer to me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm a bit, I'm a bit spaced out in terms of recommendations because I haven't slept in a long time and I was watching, I was part of a film festival recently and, and somehow I need a little bit of a break, um, from talking about films and all. And, and of course, Life is Elsewhere was influenced by Milan Kundera's Life is Elsewhere, um, you know. There is Julio Cortazar. I have a problem reading sometimes. I used to read a lot, but I have a, a lot of problem focusing now. So somehow I, I kind of um, read a lot of short stories now. And I'm also trying to write short stories. And somehow it helps me to kind of finish. Um, so Julio Cortazar, I think, was amazing. Um, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm going to leave it at this. Sorry, I mean, it's a really lame list I've given you all. But, uh, and uh, the one film that I loved was Kala, by the way. Uh, and I think uh, the director is amazing. And, you know, um, yeah, so I have to kind of put that film because I really loved it. You know, but I don't know why, how Rajni Khan did it, but I'm glad that it all happened and, and I think it's also something that was needed and and um, and uh, I mean even Anand Patwardhan's Ram Kinam and all is online. Uh, right now I also feel like a bit confused about whether something should be more about the form or you know with everything that's happening today we need to kind of be more urgent about things and sometimes both can coexist but I'm also kind of taking things in a more chaotic way, so I'm not really able to... Uh, I just watched The Last Dance last night, so I can recommend that. <laughs> My memory is quite um, short. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank uh, Jaising Anna for putting us in touch and for helping make this happen. And. Uh, for those of you who joined for the first time, we say this after every session, but definitely write about the session and uh, share it on social media or just share it with your friends, with your family. Definitely pen it down because and do it right after the session because it tends to, even if it impacted you, it tends to go away after a bit of time. So thank you so much, Saurabh. I think it. Well, thank you for having me over. And it. I think it was. Um, it was really eye-opening. Yeah, thank you to everyone who asked me questions, and I'm sorry if I was not able to answer all of them. But uh, that really helped me because I was a bit worried. You know, and when, I, when we were talking, I was a bit worried that I didn't want to again regurgitate myself. But somehow it's nice when to kind of have your questions. They are quite meaningful for me. So. so yeah, and definitely do visit uh, Cuckoo and once all of this settles down. Yes, I would love to. Yeah, I have to go visit Jessing uh, as well. You know, so, 
definitely thank you so much well take care and thank you